Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Chapter 6, Halacha 5. Now, in the last Halacha, we were talking about a sharecropper who's going along and he's contracted to go and pick the ready olives off the tree and to go produce the olive oil for the uh, landowner. And basically, that was a case where it's really going to be like a partnership because the sharecropper didn't really do all the other work. Really, the guy is being tasked to produce oil from the olives and take that. The Mishnah now is going to talk about someone who's going to sell the olives that were harvested for oil production. So in the case here in this Mishnah, we're not talking about olives that are on a tree that are ready. We're talking about olives that have already been picked and also grapes that have already been picked. That's one of the key points here. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, it's going to look like the Halaha 5 is going to be about the worry and possibility about, about these olives becoming tame. And in fact, that's, that's, not, that's not what this is about. It's going to look like that's what it's about. It's not what it's about. Here's what it's about. By the way, you can follow along in the art scroll in 59A1. Here, the whole point of this is we're in Maseket Demai, and we're talking about tithes, and we're worried that some of the tithes might not be taken. We're also worried that the Haver may do the tithes right, and the Amaretz might not do the tithes right. So why is the discussion about things being Tame in Maseket Demai? Shouldn't this be over in, in Tahoros? Shouldn't this be over in, in uh, Maseka Truma? Why is this over here in Demai? Now, this is going to look like uh, a, a case about being Teme. It's not. It's really going to be a case that ultimately the worry is going to be they're worried about the Amaretz not doing the tithes. That's really what it's about. So it's going to look like the discussion is about things becoming Teme, and that's why there's a prohibition. Ultimately, in both of the cases, it's really going to be because they're worried that the Amaretz is not going to take out the tithes. That's the punchline, okay? So this is not a misplaced Mishnah. In fact, there are other Mishnahs that are similar to this that are going to be talking about things becoming Teme. This is not one of them. This is located in Maseket Demai, because ultimately they're worried that one of the parties is not going to be doing the tithes. It's not a thing, a Tuma issue. So the Gemara, again, is going to look like it's dealing with Tuma, and it's going to say, Bet Shemai says a person may not sell his olives except to a Haber who is diligent with regard to Tuma. And Bet Hillel says a person may sell his olives even to one who separates tithes but is not careful with regard to Tuma. So right off the bat, it looks like this Malokit on these already picked olives or grapes on things becoming Teme. Now, Bet Shemai is holding that although the olives in the present state are not able to become Teme, they may still not be sold to someone who is lax regarding Tuma because the olives will ultimately become susceptible to Tuma when they soften and they become uh, they start to secrete the oil. This, by the way, uh, is in is in uh, the Gemara in Machshirim, uh, the Mishnah in Machshirim. The, over there in Machshirim, it's talking about where the owner wants this liquid to start to come out. It's desirable because it's going to start to help process in these olives. And it's going to start to soften these olives. And that's kind of the point of olive processing. If you go and you look at an olive tree, the olives are very rock hard and without a, a brine or a solution where they're going to cover these in vats and let the natural oil start to seep out and, and break down the olives, these tough olives, and start to make it so it's edible, you you're just can't eat them. You can't eat them you know, right off the tree. It needs processing. So it this is Bet Shemai, classic Bet Shemai, talking about in potential. Always when you look at uh, Bet Hillel, Bet Shemai, Bet Shemai is always saying in potential this could be like that, 
And Bet Hillel says, no, we are actually dealing with the actuality, okay? So Bet Shammai is saying that, yes, in the present state, they're not Tame, but they can become Tame because at some point this oil is going to be secreted and it's going to start to soften it and that becomes desirable and that starts to turn on the laws of Heksher where it starts now to become, uh, the food becomes susceptible to food tuma. So Bet Hillel is going to say something else. Bet Hillel, again in this Mishnah, says a person may sell his olives to one who separates ties but is not careful with regard to tuma. And over here, we see that um, Bet Hillel is saying that, well, you know, maybe they're going to go do something else with it. Maybe they're going to eat the olives before they're going to finish the processing. Um, this is going to be like a case that we covered in Masechet Shvius, where in Masechet Shvius, it's forbidden by uh, Bet Shemai to sell a plow, uh, a cow, uh, on for plowing uh, on the Shvius year. Why? Because you're not allowed to help them to prepare the field for uh, breaking Shvius and to get the field ready for, um, you know, either planting this year in the seventh year or to prepare the field in the seventh year for growing in the eighth year. And Bet Hillel ultimately says you're allowed to sell the guy who's suspected of being a Shvius violator the cow. Why? Because maybe he's not going to plow. Maybe he's going to go and harvest. Uh, he's going to go sell the meat and, and the cow uh, to butcher it for meat. And so, again, that's going to be in potentiality versus actuality. Basically, Bet Hillel is saying in actuality, he's not actually breaking uh, Shvius. You're not actually, he's not actually plowing. He's, he, he, might, he might plow, but he also might make it for meat. And that might be why he's buying a cow. And also, if you didn't sell anybody a cow... Uh, you know, there'd be a lot, you know, people wouldn't have a lot of meat on the Shvius here when you're, you know, you're kind of having like, you know, issues with food as well. So we're dealing here with a case where, hey, maybe, you know, Bet Hillel is saying, you know, maybe this fellow will go and, you know, snack from this as it's being processed. And, you know, then you don't have to worry about Tuma because it's not really in the finished state yet, uh, where it would, you know, be Heksher. So the Gemara, is, the Mishnah is going to say something that's very surprising. It's going to say, however, the discreet ones of Bet Hillel conducted themselves in accordance with the words of Bet Shammai, and they sold their olives to Havarim only. This is very, very surprising because we learn in a very foundational text in Berachot that the people who, and by the way, this is also in Mesakitpeya, the people who follow uh, the, the stringent rulings of uh, Bet Shemai or the lenient rulings of Bet Shemai and they don't follow Bet Hillel are referred to as sinners. So this is a case where how could it be that people in Bet, in Bet Hillel are following the words of Bet Shemai as a stringency and ignoring Bet Hillel. So the way the Rambam poses that is he's saying that they're not actually sinners because they didn't actually go and do this task on purpose what they're doing is they're just refraining from selling the Amaaretz, these kinds of uh, olives, and in this kind of way, they're only going to sell it to Haver. So they didn't Dafka go break it, they didn't Dafka rule this way, they didn't Dafka go do it, but they would just refrain from selling to the other one. And it, it works out that they're going like Bet Shemai on it. That's a very surprising uh very surprising how these individuals are able to go with a stringency of Bet Shemai over, um, over Bet Hillel. If you want to know more about this, you can see this in the Yershami in Berachot 1.5, also in the Bavli in Berachot 11a, that's ruling that Bet Hillel uh, has the authority and you follow uh, Bet Hillel, and if you're going to follow Bet Shemai over Bet Hillel, it's considered sinful. There is actually one case in Masechet Truma, where Bet Shemai actually acceded and actually uh, actually agreed with Bet Hillel's ruling and actually Dafka changed. So this was in this uh, debate period of time that occurred for a few years. And during this few year period of time, there is one condition where in uh, Tuma issues, 
that Bet Hillel says, oh, Bet Shammai says to Bet Hillel, oh, you're right. A lot of times it'll be, uh, when there's an acquiescence, it'll be a case where Bet Hillel acquiesces to Bet Shammai, but there is a case with uh, Tuma things that actually uh, Bet Shammai accedes on. But over here, it's strange that somebody would be going and following the rules of Bet Shammai. In truth, they're not really following it. They're just they're just not like helping the the Amaretz by like going and 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 actually making these sorts of transactions. They're just they're just for whatever reason just avoiding these transactions. So they're not actually breaking it. The Gemara is going to get into another case, and ultimately it's going to look like an issue about Tuma. And again, this is going to be ultimately an issue about. Uh, ties. It's going to be a worry that the guy's not going to separate out ties. And again, the ultimate answer is going to be a Dabai issue. So the Mishnah talks about when you have two partners and you're dividing these untied produce with a partner who is not trusted regarding ties. And the Gemara says, if there were two partners who harvested their vineyards and placed the grapes in a single wine press. Now, again, over here with this wine press, we're talking about grapes that are already harvested. We're not talking about grapes that are still on the vine. We were talking about grapes that are still on the vine as a partnership in Halakha 4. But these are, again, all outside um, in, the, in the vats, and they've already been harvested. So you have two partners here, and one is going to be a Haver, one's going to be a Amaretz. And the Gemara says, and one of the partners separates ties, while the other partner does not separate ties. The law is as follows. And it says that the one who separates ties must tithe his current portion of wine, in other words, the portion that he received when he, they divided it, and additionally, he must tithe his original share of wine wherever it is now. And again, this is going to be not a case of uh, trying to do these separations because, oh, the haver is going to be separating tithes because he wants to do it to keep everything to whore. Why? Because he doesn't want to destroy food. He wants to give to whore wine over to the Kohen. And if you have a case where you're Teme and you're separating out these tithes, you've destroyed the amount of food that belongs to the tribe of the Kohenim. So there's a prohibition on that. That's true. But you don't need that over here in Maseket Demai. That is going to be over there in Maseket Trumos. Trumos is going to go deal with all that. So why is this similar case being over here in Maseket Demai? Because they're not talking about separating the ties for the other guy because you're worried that he's going to make it teme. You're doing it because you're worried he's not going to separate the ties. That's why the sages are saying it. If you have a haver and you have a Amaretz partner, they're saying you have to separate out your ties as well as his ties. Now keep in mind, this has not been split yet. And the Rambam points out that this still has this status of being intermingled. It's intermixed. Part of, in this entire portion of the vat, part of your uh, wine is mixed in with his portion. And you guys just didn't split it yet. So you're going to take out your ties to make sure it's not Tevel. And you're going to take out his ties because you're not sure he's going to tie to make sure it's not Tevel. That's what this is saying. This is a case about Demai. And the reason that you're doing it is not to preserve the rights of the Kohen in terms of a Tuma issue. You're trying to preserve the rights of food for the Kohenim in, in case that they decide just not to tithe and also to deal in Tevel and things like that. So, uh, so there's slightly different reasons for this. And again, the reasons are very much going to match what you would expect in Demai because this is put in Demai. This is not put in uh, a different Masechet. Now, if we were learning this in, in Trumos, we would be worried about Tame issues. So the Gemara is going to move on and talk about Bet Hillel allowing somebody to sell the olives to a non haver Now again, ultimately it's going to look like this is a Tame to Hor issue. And all of these Tame to Hor issues happen to be correct. They're true. Okay. But... Ultimately, we're in Maseket Demai, and this is going to be because ultimately you're worried that one of the people is going to be buying this and then reselling it to an uneducated person who might not separate ties. That's really where this is going. 
Now, the Gemara says that Rabbi Yochanan says Bet Hillel's reasoning for this in the Mishnah is that it is the way of people to eat the olives that are accumulated in vats before the stages that the olives would become uh, susceptible to tuma. Now, Rabbi Yochanan is saying the reason that Bet Hillel does this. This is really, they were trying to find a reason why to allow this, okay? And he's saying what it is. And Rabbi Yochanan is correct, okay? But Bet Hillel is not worried that the buyer is going to keep the olives in the vat long enough for them to become susceptible to tuma. And Rabbi Yochanan is explaining that this is because Bet Hillel holds that we assume that the buyer will remove the olives from the vat and eat them before they reach the stage where it's possible for them to come uh, to May. And as we see here, Bet Hillel is going to maintain that imposing restrictions on doing business with a specific group of people is to be avoided whenever possible. And in the case of the Mishnah, Bet Hillel is allowing the sale of the olives to the non haver based on this, this leniency of a very slim possibility that the buyer will eat the olives before they secrete enough liquid uh, to separate Truma. In other words, he's just looking for an excuse and he's looking for a very small, slim chance that he could be doing something else. Again, this is going to be very much like in Masechet Shvius where you have the suspected Shvius violator going and buying a cow on the seventh year and you assume, well, he's going to go plow with it. And Bet Shemai says, no, 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 don't make that sale. Bet Hillel says, it's okay to make the sale because maybe he's doing it for meat. Over here, Bet Hillel is saying, no matter how slim the chance, maybe this guy is going to be eating these olives beforehand, and he's going to be snacking on them before they become susceptible to Tuma. Now, Rabbi Yochanan is just pointing out the nuance of that answer, and the Gemara is going to clarify this explanation, and it's going to say, but is it really the way of people to snack like this, to eat olives that are normally in a kept be kept for production of oil and that they're going to be snacking on the olives instead of making the oil? The Gemara says, rather, Bet Hillel saw fit to allow the olives to be sold to a non haver on the pretext, as improbable as it may be, that the buyer will eat the olives before they become susceptible to tuma with this oil uh, preparation production. Now, the Gemara is... Go so again, you have this vat, you have two stages, actually you have three stages, one stage is going to be where they stick together, and we're going to be getting into that. One stage is where they haven't secreted any oil yet. The other is going to be where they just start to secrete oil. And the Gemara is going to talk about a Mishnah that's going to corroborate the understanding of Bet Hillel's view. And the Gemara says that Bet Hillel follows the own reasoning stated elsewhere. We learn in the Mishnah in Shvius, chapter 5, Halacha 8, and also, it's going to be in um, chapter 5, Halacha 3, so in two places. It's going to be saying that Bet Shemai says one may not sell to him, to a suspected Shvius violator, a plowing cow during Shvius, and Bet Hillel permits it. And since the buyer can slaughter it, we're not you know, worried that he might go and use it for plowing. Again, in potential, he might go use it for plowing. But again, that's the reasoning logic behind Bet Shemai. Bet Hillel's reason is going to be, but what are you doing in actuality? Okay, and he's saying in actuality, he, you know, he can go and still have another use for it. If it were going to be a case where there's no other use for it, then yeah, of course, Bet Hillel would still agree with Bet Shemai. But there is another use for it, and that's going to be the point here with the olives. There is another use for it. You can go and and eat the olives before you go process it for oil. So the Gemara says, and and really it's going to be the same thing like with the oil, it says, you know, is it really the way of a person to go slaughter a plowing ox? And, you know, in all probability, somebody who's getting the animal that is going to be trained to plow is actually going to go plow with it. He's not going to go use it for meat. So how does Bet Hillel allow this kind of sale over there in Masechet Shvius? And the Gemara says that Bet Hillel saw fit to allow the cow to be sold to a suspected Shvius violator on this on this pretext. And this pretext is that, you know, he could go slaughter the cow rather than plow with it. And also in the case of this Mishnah, Bet Hillel is allowing the sale of the olives to a non haver on the pretext that the buyer is going to eat the olives before they become susceptible to Tuma. So 
the Bet Shammai over there is ruling that the cow is going to be trained for plowing. And you can't sell it to him because this is not just a regular cow. This is one that's, you know, used to having an ox. He's used to uh, making furrows. He's been trained how to pull the plow on a field to make their furrows. And somebody who's going to make this sale, uh, they're going to be saying is going to be basically transgressing a prohibition because you're basically going to be putting a, a stumbling block in front of a blind person. And, you know, basically you're going to be causing somebody to, you're going to be helping them to sin. And, you know, over here, in theory, selling this plowing cow during Shvias to a suspected violator, it should be forbidden because you can help this person to go break Shvias laws. But the rabbis reason that imposing decrees of this kind would actually be creating a bigger stringency and a bigger stumbling block. Um, because you would create a climate of animosity between honest people and suspected shvius violators. And, you know, that would violate the prohibition of you shall not hate. And then you're going to have, by the way, you can see that in Vayikra 1917. And, the, you know, the rabbis are generally going to avoid treating suspected shvius violators too stringently because it's going to do more harm than good. And they wanted to have a balance, and the balance was to forbid transactions that would definitely lead to sin, but allow ones that conceivably could be used for some other purpose. And again, they're trying to foster peace. And so really, they're trying to, Bet Hillel is saying, well, you know, you can maybe slaughter this. And it's really trying to find a pretext to allow it, okay? And the same thing is happening over here. So the Gemara is going to cite a Brisa, and we're talking about a Tosefeta and Maestros 314, and it's going to be talking about an incidence where Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel agree. And by the way, they agree a lot. Usually it's just going to be on a couple of small nuances, but in this case they agree too. And it's going to be where Bet Shemai is actually going to be agreeing with the view of Bet Hillel here. It says they're in agreement that one may sell to a non-haver ears of grain to make flour for his dough. And even though the seller knows that the buyer does not make doughs in a state of Tara. So this is a leniency that even Bet Shammai agrees to. Why? Because it's the common practice that on these very small quantities of grain that people are going to go roast it and eat this. They're not actually going to be making the dough at all. They're going to be feeding it as snacks to children or eating it themselves. You know, sometimes you'll see uh, at the end of a meal, people will eat seeds and nuts. And so it was a common thing in the Gemara time that people would go and roast some kernels and sweeten them and go and eat them. So if you prohibited people from doing this on a very, very small quantity, well, you know, it's not likely that they're going to go and make, you know, dough out of this. It's more likely they're going to roast this for seeds. So even, even Bet Shammai is going to agree on it. The Gemara is going to give another ruling from Esprisa. Uh, and it's going to say that the Brisa taught that they, Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel, are in agreement that one may not sell a stack of wheat, a vat of grapes, a vat of olives, except to a haver or to someone who the seller knows will process the produce in a state of tara. And again, large quantities of grapes or olives that are gathered together in the processing place, like the vat, where they're going to be left to soften up and the juices are going to be uh, coming out, it's going to be easy to extract, that's that's going to be where it's forbidden. And they both agree on that. And they're only going to allow that and in unison, where it's going to be sold to somebody who's going to process it in a way uh, where it's going to be um, uh, in a state of Tara. And Bet Hillel is going to agree that you can't sell these grapes or olives to a non haver even while it's still dry because they're going to process them. So this is even Bet Hillel acquiescing on this. So they're both, you know, this Bryce is showing that they're both, you know, agreeing with each other on, you know, a lot of these cases. And that's, of course, very nice to see. But there's a lot of uh, nuance in the reasoning on this. These are the smartest people in the world. And, you know, they're, they're being very reasonable on this. So what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a barisa that prohibits the selling of a vat of grapes or the vat of olives. 
to someone who's unreliable in matters of Tuma and Taura, because these fruits are going to become susceptible in Heksher. Again, these are in the processing vats now. And when they begin to secrete the liquid in the vat, that's going to be the desirable thing because it's, it's softening these up to make it easy so that you get more wine out of the grapes, more grape juice to make the wine, and more olive uh, oil to come out of it. And if you just leave it in the unprocessed state, not a lot comes out. So the Gemara is going to look at whether this Heksher issue in the cases of it being in the vat is actually going to be happening on a Doraita level or it's going to be a Darabanan enactment. This actually is going to be Doraita. So the Gemara says, now concerning the Heksher that takes place in a vat of grapes, is it not biblical in nature? And, and it is. So basically um, what they're going to be saying is unlike the liquid that oozes from grapes at the time of harvesting, where you have this watery secretion, this is not really oil, and really they, they didn't start the processing yet. And also if you have juice that flows from grapes at any stage, um, it you know that's going to start to set it up as hexure. And that's going to be because the, the grape juice is, is going to be kind of what you want to start getting out. It's you know certainly one of the seven beverages. And we know that there are seven beverages that can render food susceptible to tuma. Oil is going to be one, and wine is going to be another, or grape juice. And when the Brisa prohibits selling a vat to a non haver it's going to be addressing a concern that the grapes are going to become biblically susceptible to tuma from the liquid they discharge in the vat. Now, I want to point out what Rabbi Kanievsky says about this. Rabbi Kanievsky is basically going to be saying that if the hexer that takes place in a vat of olives is merely a rabbinic stringency, okay, that in other words, that the liquid that comes out of these olives at that stage is not going to be considered oil on the biblical level. Again, we're talking about this watery substance that comes out, you know, right when you pick them. And again, it's not at that next stage of being in the vat where you're actually starting to get, you know, oil coming out of it. It's a, it's a premature stage then the Brisa would not have to mention the grapes, okay? But the Brisa uh, could have simply stated that a vat of olives, you know, in which there's only a rabbinic form of hexer may not be sold to a non haver okay? And that would be obvious, says Rabbi Kanievsky, that this prohibition would apply in a case of a vat of grapes, where the hexer is immediately biblical. Again, the case over here of the olives, it's not immediately... Uh, it's not it's not coming out as oil, okay? It's coming out as a watery substance. In the case of the grapes, it's immediately coming out as grape juice. So that's going to be uh, what's a little bit different over here. And uh, over here, uh, again, it's oil that makes it susceptible to tuma. And this this watery substance that comes out, they're saying, you know, could you know could be a case where it's not going to be a condition that uh, is going to make it teme. Only in this later stage is it going to become where the oil comes out to make it teme. Rabbi Kanievsky points out the fact that the Brisa mentions the rule with regards to grape as well indicates that the hexer in the vat of olives is on par with the vat of grapes, and basically both are biblical. So in other words, it's saying that even this earlier water uh, is not a rabbinic restriction. And yes, you would say that this is not really the oil, and this is a watery substance, but basically they're, they're putting this and that together, points out Rabbi Kanievsky, and, and that's going to influence the halakha. In other words, we can learn from this that the, you know, the olives and the grapes are put together in the case of the vat, vat of the olives, where it's also going to be biblical. So uh, basically it's going to be implying that these two laws are identical. So even though you're getting this watery substance coming out, Basically, by putting it together with the grapes, it's going to be pointing out that the laws are identical between the grapes and this early stage of the olives. The Gemara says that, you know, but then does this Bryson not contradict a statement by Rabbi Yochanan? And the Gemara says that Rabbi Yochanan said, just as the rabbi stated the law uh, concerning dough found near a child, that is going to be a rabbinic stringency. So, too, they stated the law concerning the vat of olives merely as a rabbinic stringency. In other words, 
maybe this watery substance is going to be really a rabbinic stringency. Maybe it's not the right to. So Rabbi Yochanan uh, is going to be referring to a ruling in the mission in Taharos 9.1 that olives become susceptible to tuma once they become, uh, they start to secrete liquid in the vat. And, you know, again, what about what about the earlier stage where they're just picking it and this watery substance coming out even before the vat? So that could be, you know, a case where perhaps that's going to be a rabbinic enactment. So the Bryce is going to answer uh, Rabbi Yochanan was actually referring to a different rule. So again, they're going to be leaving it where they're going to be saying that once you started to process this, and even if there's a watery substance that's coming out, that's going to make it sub, sub, uh, subject to hexure on a derita level, not, not a rabbinic level. And actually what they're going to be saying about this is that Rabbi Yochanan is actually referring to something else, not about this watery substance. Um, so why is this all in here, okay? We're trying to get an idea of when, when is it that you can, you know, get to the stage where you can't start to sell to an Amma Aretz. Um, because again, you, you are worried on one hand about Taharos, but you're also worried that perhaps, um, you know, the, the Amma Aretz might separate it in a way where it's going to make the stuff teme and you've destroyed stuff, you've taken food out of the hands of the tribe of the Kohanim. And also, you've, you've, uh, you may have damaged the tithes. So in other words, um, you know, you, these guys may not tithe the stuff at all. That's really where we're going to be going with this. So Rabbi Hiskia says in the name of Rabbi Yonah, who says in the name of Rabbi Yermia, regarding what issue did Rabbi Yochanan and, you know, his disputant argue. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan stated that the law concerning the vat of olives is a mere rabbinic stringency. So what's he referring to this rabbinic stringency? And uh, it's not like what we thought about the hexure that's taking place with these olives. Rather, Gamar says he was, he was talking about the rule of attachments. And that's going to be this other stage in the olive production where the olives start to connect and bite to each other. And inside the vat, they start to cling to each other. And if you ever get a pack of oil-packed olives, you'll see that they do sort of smush together and stick together. And basically that rule over there is that, you know, in the vat, um, you can start to convey tuma to all the olives like one. And basically Rabbi Yochanan is asserting that this is going to be this rabbinic rule, that if you're going to be touching on these connected olives that's connecting together, you're going to be touching one and making it to me. It's like they're all connected. And the Gemara is going to explain Rabbi Yochanan's reasoning. So again, we've moved past this point about the watery substance that comes out. And as Rabbi, Yo uh, Rabbi Kanievsky points out, the, the fact that the grapes and the olives are put together, yes, the grapes don't have a pre-processing watery thing that comes out of it, but the olives do. And the fact that they're mentioned together and put together means that that also is going to be a stage like Hexer. You can't come along and say about this substance that it's like water, I'm sorry, it's like uh, olive juice and it's not olive oil and it's not exactly water and olive juice is not one of the seven liquids. You can't make that argument. They're saying no, but actually de Rabbanon, it's going to be uh, not treated as olive water and it's going to be treated like oil, even though it's not the actual oil you're trying to get to. But over here, we're now talking about a different part in the vat processing stage. And again, it's turning out that there's actually three parts in the stage, this early pre-watery substance. You have the part where it starts, to, uh, the oil starts to come out, and then you have this part where later on they start to bite together. And the Gemara explains his reasoning. It says, in all other places, objects that are bitten by each other, in other words, they stick firmly together, are regarded as having an attachment with respect to the transmission of tuma, whereas objects that are merely squished together are not regarded as having an attachment with respect to uh, tuma. So figs and dates, by the way, are not considered to attach to each other when they're pressed together in a single mass, 
and that you know the pieces do not tear off when these fruits are pulled apart. But apparently, the olives that says the Mara Fulda are packed into a vat. Um, you know, will stick to each other to a great extent. And even if the, you know, the Mishnah and Taharos is ruling that the olives that consolidate in this way are considered attached to each other so that they're connected with, you know, when a Tame object uh, contaminates, it will contaminate the entire mass. And the Vilna Gon, by the way, um, in the commentary in 9.3, uh, gives a good uh, explanation as to demonstrate this rule. But that's going to be the point, that the olives are going to be a little bit different than a fig cake, for example. So the Gemara says here, concerning the olives in a vat, uh, even merely being squished together is enough to create an attachment with respect to the transmission of tuma. So again, that's going to be different than dates and figs. And this is going to be, says Rabbi Yochanan, in this case, rabbinic stringency, specific to the case of olives in a vat. So although on a biblical level, these olives are not considered attached, the rabbis are decreeing in this part that the whole mass should be treated as a single entity with regard to tuma, and the rationale behind the stringency is like this. Since the purpose of placing olives together in a vat is so that they should soften and become saturated with each other's oil, the oil serves as a unifying element, and that is going to be which, you know, the olives are going to be regarded as binding to each other. That's going to be how they derive it. The Gemara is going to conclude and is going to say, but Rabbi Yochanan did agree that the hex share of olives in a vat is biblical, as the last Baraisa indicated, which put the olives with this olive juice and the, uh, the grapes together in a vat. Uh, two different vats, obviously, one, grape, one for grapes and one for olives but basically saying that once any of this liquid is coming out of the oil, uh, out of the grapes, I'm sorry, out of the olives, it's going to be considered like oil, even though it's still very watery and not really like the oil that you would expect when you pour it from a bottle. Now, the Gemara is going to talk about Rabbi Yonah, and Rabbi Yonah is going to be stating an explanation in the name of Rabbi Yermia on uh, another issue that, that uh, Rabbi Yonah decides to investigate this, and the Gemara says like this, Rabbi Yona rose to meet with Rabbi Yermia and said, did you really say this thing that Rabbi Yochanan meant only that the attachment of olives in the vat is a rabbinic law, but that Heksher should take place uh, as a biblical part? And Rabbi Yermia responded again. Over there, they're saying, again, there's three stages, and he's saying that, you know, are you saying that Rabbi Yochanan says that, you know, the first and second stage where you're putting the vat, the olives in the vat are going to be, Heksher is going to be Doraita, and the second where the oil starts to come out, that's going to be Doraita, but that, you know, this third stage where they start to bite together, and again, they're biting together not because they're even sticking as much as you would expect, like if you put two loaves of uh, dough together, where that's going to bite as well, but really, it's going to be the oil that comes from this one and that one and starts to intermingle and they do get smushed together, that all of this together is going to be like a single mass. And that Rabbi Yochanan is going to be saying that this kind of attachment, this is going to be a Dharabhanan thing. And these other two stages are really going to be uh, Doraita. And Rabbi Yermia responds to him. He says, if you wish to know my opinion, I actually disagree with the approach reported in my name. So whoever's reporting this, basically, in Rabbi Yermia's name, that's actually not what he holds. And the Gemara is going to be saying, um, and whoever's reporting in my name and hold that, you know, even the hexer of olives in the vat is really just a rabbinic stringency. In other words, um, there's, you know, perhaps people are getting confused and saying that this first stage, where it's going to be coming out as this watery substance, is going to be a rabbinic stringency. Because then they're going to say, well, this is really olive water. This is not olive oil. And so Rabbi Yermia is coming to say, oh, wait a second. No, 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 no. This rabbinic stringency that you're hearing being taught in my name, that this first stage is going to be the rabbinic stringency? No, 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 no. no. So the Gemara is going to ask how Rabbi Yermia deals with the brisa that's mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, which implied the otherwise, which is talking about 
you know, the olive water. And the Gemara taught, it says, they, Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel, are in agreement that one may not sell a stack of wheat, a vat of olives, or a vat of grapes, except to a haver or to one who the seller knows will process the produce in a state of tara. And the Gemara says, now concerning the heksher that takes place in a vat of grapes, is that not biblical in nature? It is. It is biblical in nature. And the Gemara continues, says, similarly then, the heksher that takes place in a vat of olives must also be biblical in, ne- in nature. And the Brisa associates the law concerning a vat of olives with the law concerning a vat of grapes. Again, as Rabbi Kenievsky pointed out, these are put together in the same Brisa. They are connected. So the Gemara says, what can you now say to defend Rabbi Yermia's position that the heksher in the vat of olives is merely rabbinic stringency, but this Brisa is indicating that, in fact, it's going to be on a biblical level. And we're going to be getting to the punchline here very quickly. The Gemara answers, says, interpret that the Bryce is reflecting the view of Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir says that the olive water, this is going to be the fluid secreted by the olives in the first stage, is regarded as a beverage that affects Heksha. According to Rabbi Meir, the Heksha that takes place in the vat of olives is biblical. So in other words, Rabbi Meir is saying that even this olive water that's coming out, this is even going to be considered a beverage that affects Heksha. And since the Brisa subscribes to Rabbi Meir's view, basically it's equating the law for the vat of olives like the vat of grapes. And Rabbi Yermia, though, is going to be following those who dispute Rabbi Meir and hold that olive water is not capable of affecting Heksha on the biblical level. And that's going to be an assertion that Heksha takes place in the vat of olives with the olive water, and that's going to be rabbinic. And again, the second stage is where you actually have real oil coming out. That, everybody agrees, is going to be one of the seven liquids. But we're dealing with this weird water that comes out. Now, the Mara Fulda says that Rabbi Yermia follows the view of Rabbi Shimon and is holding that the liquid secreted by oil in the vat uh, that this olive, this olive water does not affect Heksher at all, even on a rabbinic level. And so the question is that, you know, it looks like Rabbi Yermia's position is going to be based on a mission in Taharos 9.1, which indicates that the liquid secreted by olives in the vat has the capacity to affect Heksher. And basically Rabbi Yermia is saying that this Heksher, though, that the mission is talking about is a rabbinic restriction. Now, the Gemara has concluded that the Baraisa poses no contradiction to what Rabbi Yermi was talking about, that the Heksher of Olives in the vat is a rabbinic stringency. We are just no longer compelled to interpret the original statement of Rabbi Yochanan that they were just talking about, um, you know, the rule of attachment. And really, Rabbi Yochanan may mean that the Heksher takes place in the vat of Olives is going to be rabbinic, as the Gemara initially understood, and that the Brisa implies otherwise uh, is really going to be the, just the opinion of Rabbi Meir. So the, the, the point is that according to Rabbi Meir, the Heksher takes place in a, in a derite level when this olive water comes out. And Rabbi Yermia is coming along and saying, no, that's actually going to be a rabbinic restriction. And that the olive water that comes out is going to be forbidden, not, not on a derita level, but on a rabbinic level. And, and it's not going to be like Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says it's, it's olive water. Olive water doesn't count. And they're going to be saying, and Rabbi Shimon, by the way, is going to be saying that the olive water itself, even on a derabanan level, doesn't make a restriction, doesn't make a problem. Rabbi Yermia is coming along and saying, no, actually, it's going to be like what the Mishnah says in Tahoros. And over there, it's basically going to be saying that it's going to be restricted, not on the dry to level, like it would be later on when the actual oil is coming out. It's just going to be a rabbinic restriction. Now, we looked at, you know, what looks like the reason of Bet Shemai prohibiting the sale of olives to a non haver is going to be because they don't want the olives to become temet. And all of this looks like, you know, really you're trying to prevent different stages of transfer, either in stage one, stage two, or stage three, 
because at some point you don't want the, the non-haver to separate it and make it teme. And that's what everything looks like. Rabbi Zerah comes along and says, hold on a minute. This Mishnah is in Masechet Damai. This is not over there in Taharos. We're not talking about Taharos. We have rules of Tahara over there in Taharos. But this is Masechet Damai. So Rabbi Zerah says in his Gemara like this. He says, the reasoning of Bet Shemai for ruling the olives may be sold to the Haver is that it is not the way of the Haver to sell untithed olives except to someone who separates tithes. In other words, Bet Shemai's objective Again, this, again, is in Masechet Demai, is not what we thought about olives becoming teme and then they're going to ruin the olives. Really, even Bet Shemai is saying they're worried that the olives aren't going to be tithed properly. And Bet Shemai did not allow somebody, according to how Rabbi Zerah is interpreting this, is not allowing somebody to sell the olives to a non haver even somebody who's trusted to separate tithes, because the person might resell the olives to someone who's not careful in the tithes. And then it's going to come to where it's not going to get tithed at all. And that's why it's going to be forbidden. The next part of the Mishnah is going to have a, a very similar logic to it. And it's going to finish up basically the same way. It's going to look like it's going to be because of, um, it's going to be because of Teme things. So the Mishnah says, however, the discrete ones of Bet Hillel conducted themselves in accordance with the words of Bet Shemai. And the Gemara says, what is the meaning of the expression, the discrete ones of Bet Hillel? It says the most righteous of them, who are very careful in performance of mitzvahs. And Rav Chizda says, indeed, we have learned elsewhere that a righteous individual is called a discrete one. So again, really that they were, they were just refraining from these sorts of sales, says the Rambam. The final ruling of the Mishnah says, it says, if there are two partners who harvested their vineyard and they have it in a single wine press and one is going to be trusted to separate tithes and one is not, that the original one who separates tithes has to take out his own tithes and also the tithes of the other. And the Gemara is going to look at this and it's going to say, Rabbi Lazar said this mission is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir said, that the rabbis did not permit anyone except for a wholesaler to sell demai. And basically, uh, you know, where you know somebody is required to tithe tevel or demai before selling it or giving it away so that the tithing obligation doesn't get neglected or forgotten, the rabbis are going to be allowing wholesalers to deal with large quantities. And this comes up earlier in the Mishnah in Masechet Demai in 2.4, and the disagreement over there is going to be that Rabbi Meir is going to be saying that this exemption is granted by the rabbis only to actual wholesalers. And the sages say that it's going to be actual wholesalers, but also somebody who is going to sell a large quantity of demai on a one-off sale. So the Gemara is going to proceed to describe Rabbi Lazar's understanding of the Mishnah, uh, which is going to conclude that this Mishnah is going to be the view of Rabbi Meir. This gets challenged, by the way. But Rabbi Lazar interprets the Mishnah to mean as follows, that the one who separates tithes must tithe his current portion of the wine as definite tevel, and he has to tithe his original share of the wine uh, wherever it is now as demai. In other words, he has a definite obligation to tithe the wine that he has in his possession uh, because certainly no tithes have been taken from it. It's actually, it's actually real tevel. But it's going to be uncertain whether the trusted partner uh, did own any of that wine. And so now, you know, again, it's intermingled. So now he's going to be tithing this intermingled portion of the other part as demai. And that's going to be part of uh, what, they're, what they're trying to get at. So the Gemara is going to challenge this. Rabbi Yonah says that he sells and exchanges the wine, and that's going to be a definite tevel. And the Gemara is going to say, and that you rectify it, you know, as demai. In other words, considering that any wine that's exchanged is definitely untied, how can it be rectified with the leniencies of demai? So Rabbi Yonah is basically disputing Rabbi Lazar's premise that because the trusted partner is only possibly uh, obligated to tithe the wine received by the Amarts, 
he may therefore tithe that portion with the leniency of the mind. Rather, Rabbi Yonah's holding that the wine that was transferred to the Amaretz must be tithed in the same way like definite tevel, because there's no tithes that have been taken out yet. Because again, maybe the Amaretz didn't take out any of the tithes. Now, the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to say, uh, Rabbi Yonah is going to present an alternate interpretation of what this mission is saying. And it's going to assume that the partners initially have equal ownership in every drop of wine. Again, they're intermingled. The Gemara says that you do not have any way of explaining this mission except, as Rabbi Yochanan says, that the mission is in accordance with all opinions, including that of the sages who dispute Rabbi Meir. In other words, Rabbi Yonah is saying that this mission is not Rabbi Meir's position that we saw earlier on a wholesaler and demai, that this is in the position of the sages. And the Gemara says that it means like this. It says, uh, the one who separates tithes must tithe his entire original share of wine, half which is still in his possession, half which is now uh, in his partner's possession as definite tevel. And furthermore, the original share of the non-trusted partner, wherever it is now, is demai. In other words, the Amma Aretz's original share of the wine, half of it, which is now in the hands of the trusted partner, has the status of demai since we don't know whether the Amma Aretz already separated all the necessary tithes on his behalf. And also the other issue is that you're going to be tithing this for the other side to make sure it's not tevel, but you're doing it as demai because you can't take out tithes for someone else for Meiser Shani. That's why it's going to be in the range of demai. So the Gemara is going to be saying that um, the one who separates ties must tie the entire share as definite tevel. And the Gemara says the original share of the non-trusted partner, wherever he is, is demai. And again, because you've made sure that he doesn't have tevel. And basically what you gave him is going to be uh, where you take out the Truma Meiser and the Truma Gadola on his behalf, because maybe he wasn't going to take it out. But it's going to be in the status of demai because... You can't separate for someone else, Maestro Shani. It has to be yours. And he left that part on tithe. That makes it to mine. The Gemara says, therefore, the half of the latter's original share that is certainly in the hands of the fellow needs to be tied to Zemai. So this Haver is trusted to separate out ties, and the Amma Arts isn't separate, trusted to separate out ties. And therefore, Basically, what they're saying is you have to separate out ties for the Amma Aretz, and because you can't take out Meister Shani for someone else, you take out all of your own ties. You take out the ties of the other. That way, you know, the Tevil is definitely removed from it. And you give him his portion, and it's up to him to finish the tithing. But you're not allowed to go do all of the tithing for him because he, you know, he has to have possession of it to take out Meister Shani. It has to be from yours. And that half is not yours. So that's why that half that now is given over to the Amma Aretz is going to have the status of Demai. And again, it looks like, well, maybe, you know, you would be forbidding all of this from going on because of Teme Tahor issues. And it's not. All of these cases are in Maseka Demai because they're worried that perhaps part of it is going to go untithed. Have a great day.